Hello everyone, how are you all doing? You know, asterisk here yet again. It's been some time since uh, I've uploaded anything. Just haven't really been in the mood trying to make sure that, again, I think I stated this episodes prior that when I upload something, I want it to be intrinsically motivated and authentic, uh, something I want to do. Because if I don't do it that way, I'm just going to get bogged down into boredom and just lose my actual love for doing this. Um, you know, having this being just something I do on the side uh, is something I enjoy. You know, um, it's something that whenever I just feel like it, again, I just start recording. If I have something on my mind, a topic I want to talk about, I can talk about it. And I'm very thankful to all the people who spend time to again, hear me go off about various topics. So this topic, I felt like uh, I would change things up a bit. Normally, I'd review something that is involved in like entertainment and media, but I guess I wanted to talk about <laughs> life, you know, life when COVID started and life now, I guess you could say. Uh, I guess this would be a very good episode to talk a little bit more about myself, too. And, you know, you know, how I think, how I frame things, how this entire, how, how the world has changed and how it's changed all of us, including myself and yada, yada, yada. So anyway, so I'd say maybe a year or two ago, I think it was a year ago. Yeah. About a year ago, uh, I was in college. Uh, I was finishing my final semester and in the midst of my final semester, I think maybe it was April or March, can't remember exactly, um, that was when, like in 2020, around that time, when I got sent home along with other students. It was very interesting how the news of the whole, you know, viral outbreak kind of snuck up on me personally because I was hearing about it. I heard about it on the news and passing. I do oftentimes pay attention to what's on the news and politics and stuff like that. And, you know, in my day-to-day -day operation of just doing what I do, go to school, do my work, come back to my apartment, uh, play video games, watch a movie, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Um, all of a sudden, like, it was just within that, again, within March or April or wherever it started, um, you know, all of a sudden we're being told that, you know, within a couple of weeks, I, I was told by my drama teacher that, oh, it's very likely that they might end up sending you guys home. And, you know, all the other students in my class were also talking about how, oh, yeah, we might get sent home. And I was like, wait, what? Really? You know, in the back of my head, I was like, I just did not expect this. I was just like... It was so in the back of my mind that I just didn't think it would get to this level. Or if I thought that it would get to this level, I didn't think it would last this long. You know, I thought we'd be sent home for maybe a couple of days, a week or whatever. But eventually um, it, it was, you know, finally officiated that uh, the school is going to be sending us home and we're going to leave and we can leave our stuff and to take the things we need and, you know, head home and all of our classes are going to be done online until the end of the year. And so that was quite uh, surprising to me. It was quite the ambush. It, was, it came out of left field for me personally. I had been keeping, like, I've been informed of this virus and how it was, uh, it's, you know, it spread from China and, you know, it's been going all across the world. And I was actually pretty surprised by just the way it was being able to, it was able to just spread all over the globe so fast and become such a threat. And so when I finally was just at home, you know, it, it, it felt good to be home. But uh, one of the things I did like about being in college was just having my own apartment, being in my own room, being able to do my own thing, you know. Whenever I wanted food, I just go to the dining hall and grab something to eat because I have like, you know, hundreds of dollars in my account, you know, I just get what I want and then, you know, I come back. Like, you know, like the one thing that you know, kind of, I disliked about my college experience is just, I didn't have a ride or a car. So I was kind of like trapped on campus for like many months at a time. But, you know, that's, that's, 
<laughs> that's something else, you know. But yeah, it came out of nowhere just how the world just span, you know, so fast and things started to get very hectic and online classes were something that I didn't have a problem with. Uh, I actually f feel like one of the things I enjoyed about it was just the fact that, like, I just have to turn on my computer and that's it. You know, I, I didn't really appreciate how some professors were like, oh, you have to put on your video camera so I can make sure you're paying attention. Like, I was just like one of those people where it's I'm one of those people where it's like, you know, if you're someone who has to ensure people are staying focused uh, ensure people are paying attention to you, uh, you're probably not that interesting or you're just not all that, you know, you're not someone anyone wants to pay attention to in the first place. I know that's a very hardcore thing to say, but I do think to some degree that I, I don't necessarily agree with the idea that people get graded on things like attendance and stuff like that. It's like, if kids want to come to class, you know, I think they should intrinsically be motivated to get here on their own because they're interested in the topic material or they want to perform. If they don't want to perform, you can't really force them to. And even if you could just see them on a video cam, webcam stream, you know, I don't really think that means that because they're looking at you that their brain is focusing on you, you know? So, yeah, that that was one thing that perturbed me I guess like just this that I wasn't forced to have a camera because I didn't have a camera through the entire semester or whatnot but um I did feel like I did have professors um one professor in particular um probably my drama professor who I felt like every now and again he was kind of trying to like you know guilt us into getting a camera so he could see our faces and stuff like that because he wanted to make sure he was getting the attention he deserved. And he wasn't a bad professor. He was actually one of my favorite professors I had at my college. But, yeah, I, I, it, was just, it was just whatever. I, I, you know, I, I never got the camera, and I didn't care. And I enjoyed kind of the learning experience. I think my problem particularly was that I was supposed to, I you know, I'm 28 now, so... You know, I finished college, you know, very late, but, you know, I graduated and I got my degree and finished. So when I finally graduated, I was so happy because months prior to that, I was just so done with college. Like, I felt so, I, I, I feel like I got so burnt out by just being in a situation or a scenario or, or being trapped in an, uh, like, in a, an academic institution where... Um, I feel like there are other places I want to be because I've been here too long. Like I felt the same way I did when I graduated high school, um, <clears throat> you know, all those years ago, like a decade or so ago where, you know, I just was so done with everything. I was just so done with the monotony. I was just so done with the homework. I was just so done with the grades. I just felt like to a certain degree, um, I was just at the end of my rope where I was just like, I just want to get out of here. You know, um, those final months, in fact, uh, I don't know, kind of psychologically got to me because I, I was, uh, you know, I, not many people know this, but I was kind of like temporarily suicidal. But it was something that was, it was very weird. It was kind of like, um, it, it was kind of like I, I was I felt so trapped and suffocated uh, in a situation where I felt like I, I had to constantly perform and submit papers and do homework and then get graded. And then I have to take all these hard courses. And it's like I got to a point where my mind just got so fed up with feeling like like constantly being scrutinized for my performance, for my intelligence, what I can do. And I just wanted to get out. And so, you know, I'm kind of glad that I got out. Um, but I think one of the things, like, it's not like I don't like school and I don't like learning, but it's like, I feel like sometimes in life, there's a certain system that's put forth in front of you and you're expected to take certain classes to have a certain type of perspective and it's so controlling as to what flexibility and freedom you have and 
because of that's the stifling nature of the position you're stuck in, you know, you're being con- you're constantly being judged for why you're not doing more. And it's like because I don't really give a flying you know, whatever about what this is, you know, I'm not, I'm not here because I want to be, I'm not taking these extra language classes and stuff like that, that I want to, you know, that I'm being asked to do. Um, it's just an expectation and standard of the system I'm in. And so I'm taking something I don't care about. And because I don't care about, I'm not trying, like I'm someone who's very big on intrinsic motivation. So those final months of school, uh, I was just very, very glad to get out. Uh, I was just very glad to not have to deal with that anymore, at least in that capacity. I know when you get an, an, an actual job, you still have to deal with like how you how you perform. But like it, I feel like it's a little bit different, you know, because, uh, again, you can kind of choose what jobs you want to apply for and stuff like that. But school generally has, you, you know, these certain expectations of you that. You know, sometimes you have to do with like, like, like in real life, you do have to deal with abrasive bosses, but, but, you know, even in school, sometimes you have to deal with abrasive professors or teachers or, uh, you, you know, nonsensical grading standards and, um, maybe sometimes annoying classmates and stuff like that. But yeah, so that was what went on with me when I finally graduated from college, you know, last year around May. And so when I finally graduated, I had a lot of people at the time, you know, thanking me, congratulating me, things like that. But I I wasn't really, you know, excited about all that because I kind of knew that I was graduating in the midst of a pandemic. And I knew that nothing that I've done in college means a damn thing. Nothing's really guaranteed to me until I get something, you know, until I'm offered an opportunity or a position where I could provide for myself and I have the means to, 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 you know, to earn or acquire some level of sustainability, uh, or stability, you know, nothing that I've done really means anything because, you know, the way I kind of picture the system that we live in, at least here in America is just, you're doing things like I kind of picture life not life, but the, the at least the American system, particularly like a system where all you're really doing is just trying to like I look at it like a game of cards, like Magic the Gathering or, or Yu-Gi-Oh, your favorite card game or whatever, where it, or, or maybe even Texas Hold'em or whatever like that, where you're like life is you just adding new cards to your deck to increase maybe like. The consistency in which you can perform and win. But no such thing to you is ever guaranteed. So even if I do earn an associate's or a bachelor's in whatever, <clears throat> whatever field that might be, uh, I'm not really guaranteed anything. You know, it doesn't mean if I do, you know, it doesn't mean if, mean anything I, if I become an astrophysicist, doesn't ma- matter if I decide that, I don't know, I want to become a chemist or, you know, if I, you know, cause you know, I, I'm an art graduate. It doesn't matter if I want to be like an amazing artist or blah, blah, blah. Like <clears throat> unless I can get something, you know, or find something that is suitable to what I want and what my needs are, and it's available for me, you know, all I'm really doing is just collecting cards. You know, I'm, you know, once you get your high school diploma, that's one card. Uh, Once you get maybe your associates and then your bachelor's, that's another one or two cards. And, you know, once you connect with certain types of people, you know, through your social circuit, uh, social circles, that's another card. Um, You know, depending on where you live, if you live in a very resourceful place where you have all sorts of avenues offered to you and places you can work that's another card um depending on your economic status your financial class where you exist on the 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 class ladder that's another card and but but at the end of the day like all these cards like like when you make this deck of cards that allows you to go out in life and succeed and to um, you, you know, hopefully find your future. None of it is really guaranteed to you, you know, especially if 
you know, fortune is not in your favor, you know, like that's kind of the thing that kind of bothered me at the end of graduation where it was just like, you know, I have all these things, but none of these things really mean anything. Like there, you know, there are people who we might say, well, you know, percentage wise, the chance of you uh, earning a certain amount of money is like 80 percent, 90 percent. But that's quantifying things, in my opinion. The fact remains that there are maybe like 20 percent or even 5 percent of people who don't achieve this thing. And it's like, should people's happiness and satisfaction really be determined just by number percentages? You know what I'm saying? Like, at the end of the day, like, shouldn't these things be just guarantees, you know, when people put in their work? Why is it just based on whether I go to an interview and someone has a positive impression of me? Why should it be based on whether or not I'm you know, buddy, buddy friends with someone in a business, like these things to me are what keep me up at night, you know, because then it kind of, it's kind of what makes me feel like, you know, this isn't really a true meritocracy. Uh, you know, I don't think you can ever have one with people because there's always going to be some leverage or levity people have or use that is outside of the methods they used to add cards to their deck, I guess you could say, or, or, or they're using, you know, like if you're, if you're, if the idea or the social perception is that you do something for four years and you get something, I believe you should get something, you know, it should be something that is just given to you, you know, but that's not really how it works because we kind of live in a world that, you know, if, if let's say you, you, you know, I'm trying to think of an example, but, but like, but I hope you understand what I'm getting at. Like, no matter how much hard work you do, <clears throat> sorry about that. There is really like the guarantee, you know, is just kind of a percentage based chance based on increasing your odds. And I know that sounds like me, I'm quantifying things and blah, 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 but it's like, that's kind of what bothered me upon graduation and why it was so hard for me to really even care. Even when I've made, for instance, uh, when I was put on the dean's list, I was put on the dean's list in college like twice. I didn't really care because I was just like, whatever, like, I guess I can put that on my resume, you know, but again, I don't really live in a world where they're going to really often look at those things and just be like, oh, well, you did this work, so you, you get this. It's, well, I have to hope I find a business or something like that where there's an opening for me where someone else, um, you know, I, I just, I guess, outbeat them. But it's like, should I have to outbeat someone just to prove that I deserve to live and be provided a salary? So that's what bothers me. So graduation, I was kind of glad it was all over, but that's kind of what was bothering me and why I wasn't very happy, you know, because even now through, you know, thick and thin of the pandemic and stuff like that, it was just, you know, those thoughts that grinded at me for a time and still do now. Um, but yeah, so that was what was going on. And then after graduation, you know, had some issues with the apartment I was living in, you know, with a certain family, uh, eventually had to, the, the house was, the, the apartment I was living in was sold after a couple months due to certain reasons, certain family conflicts that were occurring. And so, yeah, that wasn't really fun. And at the same time, I was trying to find a situation where I could you know, find my own private place and stuff like that. But, you know, I've always felt like finding some place to live is a, you know, it's a process that takes time and careful consideration. You can't just decide you want to just live with anyone, you know, because I feel like there's a big difference between, I've had, I've heard people talk about how they want to live with their friends sometimes, but I don't know if they know, if they understand like the optics of a situation like that, <clears throat> because when you meet your friends at school or at work, 
you know, you're dealing with them when you're out in public and you're doing things together. But then what happens between you and them when you're living within the same four walls as them, you know, is a completely different landscape. And that's why I feel like finding someone to live with or moving out was a very difficult thing for me. I had options outside the state that I live in, but they weren't really good. <clears throat> and so, I mean, I wouldn't say those options weren't very good. I'd say that it just didn't benefit my cer the circumstances necessary for me to hold on to certain insurance benefits. Let me say that. And so, yeah, um, you know, after that problem, uh, you know, had to move in with other family and... Yeah, and so that that was just the situation. So, you know, my my wish has always been to just move out and move into my own place. But it's like, you know, I'm not, you know, I have to accumulate a certain level of, you know, part-time income first. Because, you know, finding the appropriate work for me that pays, um, you know, well enough money is, is quite difficult. And so, so... Yeah, that's basically what, you know, th th that's kind of like the technical stuff that I was going through in terms of like determining my future and where I want to, what I want to do and where I want to live, where I've just been kind of stuck. And even though I know there are jobs out there that are hiring, the, the, you know, the quality of the jobs to me is what's important. I've always said that the quality of something is important. Obviously, if you're very desperate, you got to take what you can get. But I feel like even within the midst of desperation, it's still not worth to do something if doing that something still ends up with you not being able to accomplish the work and they let you go. So, yeah, even though there are places like factories and Amazon and blah, blah, blah that are willing to pay bonuses to go work for them and stuff like that, it doesn't add up to anything if, you know, because I've done work like that before, it didn't really last. Uh, it doesn't mean anything if they're basically going to, you know, work you like a slave driver and if you can't uphold their unrealistic standards or they give you only half that money up front and then they only tell you they're going to give it to you six months later. Like, for all I know, I feel like anytime someone says, I'll give you $2,000 uh, up front, and they decide they're going to give you half now, they have every reason, they, they, they're going to maybe cultivate a reason not to give you the other two thousand, uh, the other thousand later. You know, it's just to buy time where it's like, they're going to hand out money and then some people are going to drop off and the people who stay and put up with everything will get that thousand. And that's how you have, you know, you have people who are willing to put up with whatever nonsense that you're giving them. And, you know, and that's kind of the hustle because there's no way people are just going to give out money just because, you know, there's going to always be a catch, especially in this country. So that's what I <clears throat> basically have you know, make, have made in considerations of that. So, you know, when thinking about like some of my aspirations, I want to do voice acting and stuff like that, but I, I feel like I want to do it on my own time. And so I created my own media sort of network hub called Revelscape Nexus. And I'm going to be doing that part time. And that's why I'm kind of doing this vlog stuff now. So I can build kind of an archive of you know, my performance and how I sound and how I talk. And that's why I'm very happy that people listen to this kind of stuff. So that is the end of that segment having to deal with like, you know, what spot I'm in now in terms of like what work and what jobs I'm doing and, you know, what I'm looking to do, you know, just trying to save up and go from there. Um, I would say over the course of this pandemic, another significant event that has happened was um was it the George Floyd murder by you know it was it Eric Chauvin putting his knee on um that man's neck and killing him and the world to see I thought that was a very I think that that moment that moment like during that entire you know time period and that summer blew up in ways I hadn't imagined. Everybody was so hooked up, I guess, to the internet that everyone was so well aware of what happened and they were sharing it and it spread like wildfire. And, you know, it's very unfortunate what happened to, uh, you know, Mr. George Floyd, 
you know, rest in peace. But, you know, in many ways, I think that, I think that, like, like I'm, I'm so kind of glad that the world, you know, has, to a large degree, kind of seen the underbelly or underside of what this country is. You know, because I feel like it was a very masks off, mask off moment. And it woke everybody up and everybody was out protesting. And because the protesters were treated a certain way by also the police enforcement offices, uh, law enforcement offices and, and stuff like that. Now we kind of have a culture of people that understand what the problem is with this country. And so I thought, you know, it was very heartwarming to see such positive reception all over the world. There were obviously people who were trying to detract from it and be like blah 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 you know trying to criminalize mr george floyd saying uh he was this and that and he was a criminal and he should blah 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 and trying to distract from the fact that you know he was he was just he was suffocated on a concrete floor while screaming for his mother but then all of a sudden we want to dehumanize him because of all these labels when we call people things like criminal and blah, 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 and take away their humanity. It was very sickening stuff to see. But I'm kind of happy that such attention was drawn to it. I kind of am happy that even electorally speaking, when we talk about Trump and the election and him losing and stuff like that, I'm very, I, I kind of like that, you know, every, like, I feel like forever, like, for a very long chunk of my life, a lot of us have been living inside kind of an illusion and all these moments have acted as illusion breakers for a lot of people across the world. And they see what actually ends up happening to the disenfranchised, the marginalized and stuff like that. And the type of leaders and people who are in positions of power who don't really deserve to be there because they they have the merit to be. They're just kind of born into these positions of influence and affluence, and they get they garner more and more power. You know, like I remember being a kid, and I and I think I was reading a textbook or watching some show or or something like that where you know they were talking about how oh, you could be president too, Johnny. And, you know, like I remember in elementary school, there were these videos they would show us. They were like, oh, all of you could be president. Mr. Obama didn't think he could be president. You could be president if you just put your mind to it. But it's like if you do research, like it's very, very freaking expensive to like run for office. <laughs> you know, like you could feel like you would be good for the job, but you would just that you know, the way the system works, you would just be barred from entering just because you don't you don't exist within a certain economic bracket. So, yeah. That uh you know, that 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 that's kind of why like with all the terrible things that have happened now, you know, it's kind of through tragedy truth reveals itself. And that's kind of why, that's kind of been the silver lining for me throughout all of this, um, you know, over the past year and a half or wherever or so, where within tragedy, there's truth. And within recognizing this tragedy and accepting this truth, we can, you know, we can, we can make corrections or we know what to fight is what I'm trying to get at. And I was very happy to participate in the election. And, you know, I hadn't at the time, I wanted at the time of like the George Floyd protest stuff, I wanted to talk about like, uh, I wanted to talk briefly about like my experiences being, you know, black myself, because I do feel like um, that I kind of grew up colorblind. I kind of grew up with the idea that like, oh, we're all human and, y you know, there's no such thing as like, y you know, being black and blah, blah, blah. There's no such thing as like race and blah, blah, blah. It's like, we're just all in this together. Kumbaya. I used to be all, all on that, but it's like, that's just not how the system works. The system very much, the system and the people part of it are very much going to judge you based on what they see of you first you know, and then they're going to run it home to the touchdown line. And for a lot of people, that has impacted how far they could break barriers and stuff like that. 
And even though the world has incrementally improved in that regard, there's still a lot of work to do. I do think that maybe at certain parts of my life, I've been judged as... Like, I remember in fifth grade, I had a kid, basically, who... um, You know, I'd see him hanging with a group of uh, kids I used to, you know, invite myself to hang out with. And he would kind of be very shy to give me any sort of reception. And then after a couple of months of the semester... Uh, he, you know, I remember him hearing me talk about certain things and then he turns around and he's just like, wow, you're not that scary. And it's like, at the time I didn't really think much of it. I was just like, okay, maybe he was just intimidated by me, but it's like in retrospect, you know, there could have been a very racial component to that. So yeah. And, 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 and even in college, I remember just walking home and there was this drunk kid who said I looked like some rapper, and that got me, that got me really, really, really angry, um, because I know he was drunk, but drunk just means that your inhibitions are lowered, and I just didn't like being compared to a rapper because I just don't. I've never liked being a, like th- this idea that like because I'm black, uh, I must like rap and hip hop, you know? Because I do like rap and hip hop, but I'm also a very big fan of like uh, electronica, uh, rock and roll, uh, Japanese rock, Japanese pop, like, you know what I mean? Like, I don't like being pigeonholed into that subculture of just rap, even though I like rap, but it's not, I don't like being pigeonholed into that subculture. Uh, it really gets me angry and agitated because it, even to a certain degree, you have to kind of understand that like hip hop, most of like the musical genres have their own kind of subcultures, things like that. But it's like, I I feel like I grew up in, <laughs> I grew up in like a New Jersey suburb, and so it's just like I feel the least like the least hood person you can imagine, and I don't like feeling like that's what I'm being judged as because it's the farthest thing you can make a judgment about me. Um, you know, I've also. Uh, You know, I've also, I feel like in the past have been judged because, you know, I don't sound uh, a certain way. I don't talk a certain way. Um, You know, something that gets me angry is just, you know, I remember working security and being like, like I had these group, these group of kids who were walking around the mall causing trouble and they, they like raised their fist in the hand with the black power sign. I was just indulging them and I did it. They were like, oh, you put it on the wrong hand. You're supposed to do with the other hand. And, you know, I felt like I was being judged for, again, not being black enough. And that, that that's something that, again, has kind of always bothered me. Just feeling like I, I have to justify myself as being acceptable to different groups of people. And I have to fit into certain groups. And it's just like I've always had a very difficult time fitting into any of those things uh, just based on just race and stuff like that. Even though I... I you know, humbly and wholly acknowledge, you know, the disenfranchisement of marginalized groups and stuff like that. It's like, I kind of wish I could just exist, but it's like the system is always a system and the people who govern it are always going to judge me by that identity. Uh, you know, cause it, again, a couple of days ago started work and I still had, I, I still met someone who, you know, they met me and they were kind of surprised for some reason that I was so formal and professional and things like that. And it's like, why are you surprised that I'm formal and professional? You know, so it's little things like that that I've had to deal with. I don't feel like I've ever dealt with like overt racism, like someone, you know, using certain racial epithets or anything like that against me. I haven't had that, but it's been very subtle things I've noticed. Uh, and and sometimes it's not even just from groups outside my own. Sometimes it's me being judged by people with the same skin color as me, you know, um, being like, oh, you're not down with the program and stuff like that and blah, blah, blah. So, I just kind of have reached a point where I'm just like, fuck everybody, (laughs) you know, like I just want to be me and that's it. So, yeah, so that, you know, that's what I, you know, when thinking about that, this is going to be sort of the, the segment that I didn't released 
about, you know, my experiences being black and how it really agitates me and, you, you know, and feeling like I do, I do feel like as a whole, you know, my issue with the world and the United States is that there's a lot of rampant anti-intellectualism and people have a lot of pride in just, it, it's, it's pride in not conforming, but that non-conformity is also having some sort of having some sort of happiness in not being informed, you know, and doing whatever you want. You know, it's like in America, I feel like there's a hyper, there's a lot of pride in being free uh, because you refuse to absorb certain things that you learn, but it's like not everything you learn, you know, is, is a bad thing. Some of the things you do learn, wherever that may be in school or outside, you know, and, you know, whether in textbooks or the bookstore or whatever are, are very helpful in being tools you can use to liberate yourself. You know, it's, it's not just a feeling, uh, that you need in order to overcome a struggle and to understand the commonality and humanity you share with other people. Um, it's, it's being, it's being well-read and well-learned, you know, and being able to, I guess, suss out sources and stuff like that. So, yeah, that is basically um, how I feel about, you know, you know, my segment again on my feelings on a lot of racial things that I've had to deal with and how I feel. It's just having to fight to either be accepted or conform to be accepted just makes me want to slam my head against the wall. Um, you know, cause I have been judged, I've been told blah, 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 been, you know, someone who's scary, I've been told blah, blah, all sorts of things. But again, I haven't faced overt racism. I haven't had difficult run-ins with the police. The only time I had a very bad run-in with the police was when I hadn't, I, it was like, it's not like I did anything. I was reporting something stolen and I'm still having this police officer basically while I'm explaining myself for, you know, an item that I lost, you know, he's basically telling me like, he basically was implying that, you know, you're, you're not very, he, he said something that was along the lines of, oh, you're not, you're kind of slow on the uptake or something like that, which is kind of, an insult towards my intelligence, you know, again, I'm not going to say whether it's racially motivated or not, but it's one of those things where, you know, after making that report, calling him days later to see if he found my headphones, you know, I tried to do my own investigating about like the cameras and which, which ones he could look at. And I called him to tell him like, all the things I picked up and he was like, Oh yeah, thank you. Thank you for searching. But we didn't find your headphones. And I'm just like, but did someone enter the bathroom before, you know, after me? And they were like, yeah, someone went into the bathroom and I was just like, could they have put it in their book bag? And they were just like, yeah, but we can't do that. Which is just basically, you know, me feeling like I was being stonewalled and they didn't care. Cause months later I ended up joining, uh, I ended up enrolling in a journalism statistic course. And there's a lot of theft on campus that they don't report and ignore. So it's not just me. I found out. So, so yeah, that's what happened. That's, you know, that, that I guess that would that'll end the segment with me and my identity and the George Floyd stuff and I mean, even when it comes to how I feel about police, I feel like I, I wanted to be a law enforcement officer myself, but, you know, down the line or down the road, I realized um, when I was working in security, we were making certain judgments to preserve certain places or protect certain places, but it was mostly at the behest of those who contracted us at the cost of our customers that attend the store there was two girls who got jumped by a gang of kids and you know my superior officer pretty much said you know you're at fault you know you should you know wrong place wrong time I've seen you here before causing trouble so you're going to be suspended and banned and the other kids who assaulted them were able to run off scot-free asked him if he would hold them accountable he said yeah yeah we'll get them and never did so I didn't want to be a part of that so I walked away so that's how I feel about you know, my racial identity, which I don't really think I, I really believe in as a thing, but I only engage in it because of that's the only way you can confront these issues by talking about them in these sociopolitical ways. Um, and how I feel about, you know, just 
police, you know, in general and the situation and the election too. Um, it's a very good thing that we did not get another year of Trump because absolute maniac. And yeah. Uh, oh yeah. And the January 6th, um, riots or whatever. That was, that was wild. You know, I, that's not something I expected to happen, but you know, I, I'm kind of glad that moment happened because again, I feel like it was another mask off moment for the world to see that this country is not as pristine and perfect as it portrays itself to be. And, you know, I, th- I, I, and, and we can still see from the things that were done and the things that were said that I feel like oftentimes the civil war hasn't ended in this country. It, you know, there are still people who believe in a lot of the history of the Confederacy. They, you know, there are people who use the military just as props for a lot of their discrimination and entitlement. And so I, I felt like they, you know, that whole event was them shooting themselves in the foot because now I feel like people are more aware and, you know, the people who've been saying for the longest time that this country still has a problem with, you know, hatred uh, or, or entitlement finally see that they were not crazy. So, yeah, we'll see how that goes. But, yeah, so far, uh, you know, I got my vaccine uh, during this whole year. Uh, I got the Pfizer vaccine, got my two shots. If they tell me to get a booster shot, I'll get it. I have not been ignorant about it, but I will say that I did. I was planning on holding off getting it and I decided to get it because my friend actually caught COVID. And so he told me about how bad it was and that motivated me to get it earlier. I was going to get it, but I was going to hold off on it, but I ended up getting it early. Um, I'm someone who, you know, has uh, at, at risk complications with my own health and stuff. So, you know, I was able to go before everybody. But yeah, it's just a shame that ignorance has run rampant, misinformation has run rampant, and people are absolutely terrified of having to get this vaccine. You know, uh, this one thing that people in other countries around the world would, you know, push other people over for. People in this own country, in our own country, are just like, nope. There's nanobots in it. I don't want to turn into a reptoid. Um, you know, you're not putting a, a GPS tracker on me. I'm no barnyard animal. Blah 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 blah. You know, it's it's crazy. So yeah, that's been, I guess, my time with COVID. Uh, I do hope that things improve for not just myself, but everyone else included. Um, again, I think within tragedy, there is truth. And within truth, there is a level of correction and improvement that can be achieved if we fight for it or want it. You know, that's my stance. So yeah, that's the end of this episode. It's kind of went on longer than it probably should. But, you know, that's what I've been going through for the past year and a half or more than a half or whatever. And hopefully, again, we can see much better progress. We shall see. Uh, This felt good to record. This episode, it was different because I felt like I was speaking from the heart. Not that I don't always speak from the heart, again, but it felt very therapeutic to get certain things off my chest, so... Again, I appreciate any and all of you who have listened. You have a wonderful night, day, evening, morning, whichever. Take care. Goodbye.